All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Autodesk Virtual Academy as presented by Kativ Technologies. The date is September 16, 2021. Where did the summer go? I'm not really sure, but I am quite looking forward to the fall time already. The weather's nice and cool here in Southern California and my uh, electricity bill couldn't be happier. <laughs> and so uh, we got a really interesting topic here for you guys today, um, a more of an interesting presentation, really. So we're going to I'll explain a bit about that as we get into it. But we're going to be talking about Nastran and simulation in general here today. Uh, joining me here today is as well as going to be Pedro Chow, our simulation practice lead here at Kativ. Uh, Pedro, are you on, my man? I'm here. Uh, I don't... There we go. All right. <laughs> yeah, how's the bathroom construction going, man? You can hear. <laughs> yeah, everything was quiet, and I think uh, they knew that I was presenting here and decided to make noise. I apologize for that. <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we could have you. Yeah, Pedro's actually relatively new at the company over here, and he's uh, he's kind of shoring up some of our simulation practice here at Kativ Technologies. And so he is quite a get, and I'm very appreciative of your time here today, Pedro. So thanks again for being on here. Um, and Pedro's going to be supporting me throughout this conversation as we get more into the kind of simulation conversation. Um, do you have anything else you want to say here, Pedro, right at the out gate here? Well, uh, you know, I'm just going to mute myself whenever, whenever I'm not speaking here, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Much appreciated, yeah. And so again, this is a traditional Zoom webinar. So if you guys haven't been on a webinar, there's going to be slightly different controls than the regular webinars that you may have been on so far. Um, there's a Q&A section, there's a chat panel, we'll all be uh, submitting information as we go along. Um, but feel free to submit questions as we go along as well. Or any concerns if you have uh, issues with quality or audio, for example, and we could make adjustments live as we need to. And uh, also be on the lookout for a survey at the end of the session as we do take feedback pretty seriously. And we're always looking for ways to improve this weekly webinar, okay? And so that said, let's, uh, let's get right into it. Let's see what we got going on here today, shall we? Um, and I'm hoping you guys could all see my screen here so far. We are looking at the agenda here today, right? Agenda, we're gonna do some quick introductions. I do wanna talk a bit about Pedro. I wanna talk a bit about Kativ's simulation practice here that we've been putting out recently. I wanna talk a bit about simulation overall. And um, as you will notice from the title, we're actually gonna be doing a rerun of our Nastran 101 session from a couple of years ago now, actually. Um, so Nastran is of course, one of the different solvers that we have available, but um, we're going to be talking about it uh, as a part of our overall simulation practice solution here at Kativ. Um, and of course, quick summary at the end and a Q&A at the end as well. And again, feel free to submit questions throughout the session by, uh, if you have any concerns or questions along the way. Okay. Um, cool. Let's uh, see what's next over here. Pedro, you want to talk a little bit about yourself, man? You're quite, you got quite a lot of history on this page, huh? <laughs> uh, a little bit, yes. So uh, I joined, I'm the uh, simulation practice lead here at uh, Kativ. Uh, I joined the company about uh, two months ago. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I have over 30 years of experience doing simulation. Uh, primarily on the mechanical side. Uh, I have worked uh, in uh, many uh, interesting uh, projects. I worked, uh, just in case uh, you are, uh, you know, uh, wondering, what is uh, you know Spanish or Portuguese name doing uh, <laughs> before uh, a Chinese last name? I grew up in Brazil, and uh, so that's where I got my uh, naval engineering uh, 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 education. And um, but I, I have worked in the Brazilian space program. I have worked in the uh, uh, Brazilian nuclear program. I worked in some uh, you know secret uh, pro projects uh, when. Uh, uh, back in Brazil, uh, where we were doing some enrichment, uh, uranium enrichment uh, uh, oh, yeah. project. And God, um, tell us that. Do we have to cut the stream here? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it was interesting that uh, that project, uh, you know, I had to sign saying I couldn't uh, discuss what I was doing with uh, anybody. So it was very interesting. But, uh, you know, I have worked. Uh, also in the uh, Atomic Energy of Canada, which is a the nuclear program in, uh, in Canada, uh, designing and analyzing uh, can-do uh, nuclear reactors, 300 megawatts, 600 megawatts, uh, did uh, a seismic analysis on uh, uh, research uh, uh, reactor as well. 
And all, all of that was, was, was done uh, using, using ANSYS, which is one of the products that, that we have here at the uh, Yeah. I'm um, surprised that like the breadth that, you know, ANSYS really covers, because that's a lot of different stuff in a lot of different places. You don't necessarily expect to see simulation per se, at least not structural yeah. simulation, right? Right, right. So, you know, as a, as a consequence, uh, yeah, I, uh, Adam, Adam asked me to put the three, uh, a fun uh, fact about myself. So I have lived in uh, three different continents, born in Taiwan, grew up in Brazil, and then uh, North America. Wow. And, uh, you know, four different countries. Uh, so at home, it's uh, uh, truly a United Nations. We have uh, people in, uh, born in three different countries. Taiwan, two of my daughters born in, in Canada, and then a, a younger daughter born here in California. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Pedro is such an interesting individual, man. And just for, for some perspective, if you guys are wondering, I mean, Pedro has been doing simulation longer than I've been alive for. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's been at it for quite a while so again i appreciate all the expertise you bring to the company thank, into this country. thank you for calling me old adam <laughs> <laughs> of course you're welcome <laughs> and so again if you guys have any questions about simulation in general feel free to submit them during this one because i'm sure that regardless of the industry that you're in there's probably some application that would be relevant to you guys here so uh, let's uh let's get into it. let's see what else we got over here um so yeah, a big question we've been asking ourselves and our customers, Pedro, is you know, when and why do we simulate over here? Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on on the slide here? Yeah, sure. So um, this is uh, very interesting because uh, uh, you know we saw this uh, uh, picture at the uh, NC side. So this, you, the A that you see there is uh, the logo for uh, NCs. And uh, you know, simulation is almost like uh, you know it uh, gives you a superpower. So when uh, you uh, uh, talk about uh, doing tests, right? Uh, you know, tests can tell you that if your component passed or it didn't pass, right? But uh, you don't really know why it passed or why it didn't pass, right? And then the, I think that's where simulation will bring you a lot of value. You can, for example, if you're doing a structural analysis, uh, you can understand exactly what is uh, the load path that in your component, and then it can tell you how much load is going to this part of the component, how much load is going to the other part of the component, and you can really dissect what is happening in the model or in the component you're trying to design or analyze. Um, when I started uh, doing simulation uh, over 30 years ago, uh, I think because of uh, computer limitation, computing power limitation, I, there was, you know, only so much you, you could do. I, I can still remember uh, doing, a, you know, plotting a relatively small, uh, no, it's a small model for today's standards, but back then it was a relatively large model. I think uh, we were analyzing the, the wheels of a train and the just half model and then something like a 13, 1400 elements. I would issue an e-plot command. I could go out for lunch come back and then it was just finishing the the e plot uh plotting the, the elements in, on my screen so that's that's when uh, it was in the in the beginnings of the uh, finite element today you know compared to what we used to do 30 years ago we, we you know we we can do a lot uh, it's almost a limitless so we are uh, simulation is in uh, telecommunications you know 5 5g 6g internet of things you know, autonomous vehicles, AI, uh, healthcare, you know, the, the list is shown there, but, uh, you know, basically almost anything you, you, you can think of, you can apply a simulation to it. Not only um, a stress analysis, that, that's, that's where I, I come from, but, uh, you know, batteries, uh, you know, electric uh, aircraft, you know, anything that uh, you, you can think of, you can use a simulation for. Okay, so the simulation allows you to, uh, you know, really speed up uh, the product development. Uh, uh, you, you, you can think that uh, you, you need to build a prototype. It will take, uh, you know, days, weeks, months to, to, to just uh, uh, build a prototype. If you're talking about the analysis uh, and simulation, you know, we would like to say you can do that in, in a couple of hours, but, uh, you know, realistically speaking, if you, depending on the changes you are uh, incorporating into your model, it may take uh, some time, but 
the power is there. Once you have uh, built a, a baseline model for simulation with a relatively little effort, you can just go make all the modifications, uh, you know, uh, on the computer on, 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 uh, uh, virtually, and then uh, just, uh, you know, run. And then the, the, at, at that point, it's just a runtime in your computer. So you can go through a lot of iterations, a lot of uh, different uh, 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 what if scenarios a lot faster than if uh, you would have to go through a you know, physical prototype. Okay, so here at uh, Kitiv, uh, today, uh, pr uh, uh, presentation will, is going to, to focus on NASTRAN. And by the way, NASTRAN stands for NASA Structure Analysis. So it was uh, developed uh, within NASA uh, during the space program when uh, uh, John uh, JFK, he made that uh, famous uh, speech saying, you know, we are going to put a man in the moon by the end of this decade. And um, so, uh, uh, inventor Nastron is based off that original uh, Nastron uh, 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 program that, that was developed at NASA. Uh, and then uh, we also have, uh, you know, ANSYS available here at the KT. But, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a solution provider, as a, you know, services provider, we want to be a software agnostic. So whatever uh, our customer uh, is using for, um, simulation, we want to be able to deliver in that platform, okay? So you can go to the next slide, slide if you want, uh, Adam. I got you, yeah. And uh, so we, Kativa is a, is a technology uh, provider, uh, but you know, we are much more than that. We want to be, uh, we are a, a complete, uh, you know, <clears throat> engineering services and uh, uh, technology provider. Uh, we have a lot of experience in house uh, doing all sorts of uh, simulation going from stress analysis to computation of fluid dynamics to electromagnetic analysis. Okay, so uh, uh, what we want to do is we want to help our customers uh, to be, uh, uh, to improve uh, your, your product, to, uh, to uh, understand uh, you know, how your product is going to behave in, in real world. Okay? And then we want to do that in a very cost-effective way. So what we'll do is we want to partner with you, we want to sit down with, with you, understand your simulation uh, challenges, understand your product development challenges, and uh, you know, bring that process virtually, create a model that can really uh, uh, mirror the, 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 the reality for you. And, uh, you know, we want to uh, uh, truly work with you to, to, to make you uh, successful. Uh, here you can see some uh, a contact point here, the Kativ, uh, Jim Ochoa, he's uh, the, our uh, director for uh, the ANSYS uh, uh, business. And if you want uh, more information, if you want to, uh, to work with us, uh, you know, please, uh, do contact him. You have his email address. You have his, uh, his uh, telephone number here. And, uh, you know, we are here to help you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, again, the, the practice, uh, the new kind of sim simulation services we have at Kativ are, you know, kind of a great way to get those capabilities without necessarily taking on the efforts and cost yourself, right? And so definitely keep that in mind as we go over all of this. And I, I just pasted Jim's info in the chat message there as well. So if you guys want to have more conversation about any of this stuff, especially you know, partnering with us for any kind of services, feel free to reach out and you know expand your capabilities with us, no problem. Um, but that said, let's go ahead and get into the meat of this. There's a few more slides at the end of this presentation as well, but um, the main topic of today's presentation is going to be Nastran in particular. So um, we originally aired this video about I want to say like three years ago or something like that, quite a while ago now. Um, however, um, part of the effort at Kati recently is just to kind of gauge interest in the simulation again, right? Kind of understand where the interest is. I want to see if Nastran is still interesting to the audience, for example. And so this particular session is a very entry level kind of discussion about Nastran 101 and the use of elements inside of Nastran itself. So video is not terribly long, but it is going to be a rerun. So feel free to, you know, 
watch, of course, and the original video is available online in addition to all of this. Um, however, um, Pedro has expertise in both ANSYS and NASHTRAN. So if you guys have any questions about NASHTRAN, especially its general applications, feel free to message us. We want to make sure the conversation is still engaging as we go ahead and uh, run this video again. Okay. And so uh, that said, um, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, if that's all right with y'all. Um, do you have any thoughts on, I guess, NASTRAN just right out the gate here, Pedro? I'm going to start the share here off screen, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, as, as I mentioned, so NASTRAN started, uh, you know, at, at NASA. Um, it is uh, probably one of the uh, standards when it comes to, you know, uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, it's a very widely used in the uh, uh, aerospace industry. Um, and then, you know, we can talk more about ANSYS, I think, when you want to, to, to move on to multi-physics and uh, multi uh, type of uh, simulation, then NASRAN has, uh, has uh, some, uh, some limitations there. But, uh, you know, the good thing is, uh, is that, uh, you know, we, there are a lot of uh, you know, solutions for you available within uh, the Kativa uh, portfolio. Perfect. Okay. And so let me know if you guys could hear this video. Um, this was a relatively new workflow. So let me know if you guys Shorten, could Shorten uh, the testing phase. It allows you to explore design options yeah, early in the design let cycle. Let me know in chat if you guys could hear audio Before expensive so prototypes far. are created and tested. Now, in order to create and calculate and compute displacements and stresses and strains, or any other results that, that may be of interest, uh, the FEA process, the finite element analysis process, can be used to obtain uh, these desired results. So the process begins by breaking down your CAD model into small uh, building blocks, into a series of finite elements. Um, and these, as you can see here, are, are the elements. Now these, now Nashan and CAD is gonna take this CAD geometry for you and it can create um, a mesh. A mesh is just an interlocking of these elements, a mesh for you. Now these elements are connected to each other at, at points called nodes. And it is at these nodes that node that loads and constraints of any kind, whether they be structural or thermal, um, it's at these nodes that they get applied. Now, why is there such a big focus on, on elements and mesh? Why is the type of mesh and the size of mesh important? Now this, little uh, plot shows the effect of the mesh on the von Mises stress at an area of stress concentration. Now, mesh number three is consider has considerably more elements than mesh number one. And as we can see, the, re the change in the value in the actual final result is sizable because especially between mesh one when you look from mesh one to mesh three, it's almost double. And this is because the number of points uh, that are present to one represent the geometry and two to calculate these results at these um, points of stress concentration, these areas of stress concentration um, has, has greatly increased from mesh one to mesh three. Now in general, as a general rule of thumb, a higher element count is gonna to lead to greater solution accuracy. In most problems, however, refining the mesh beyond a certain point leads to very small, if any, changes in solution. This convergence is one of the primary means of actually verifying the results of an FEA study, and we'll we'll look at that in, in short. You can control the mesh to lead to convergence by reducing the element size and in conjunction, monitoring the changes in the results. Now models with certain complex elements tend to converge with smaller element count than, than others, but the time and resources um, associated with these complex problems may sometimes be prohibitive. So most FEA studies at the end of the day require you, to, the analyst, to strike a fine balance between um, analysis time, the cost to run the analysis, and the desired accuracy. Now let's look at the different types of finite elements that we have in NASTRAN and CAD. Now the simplest element is a line made of two nodes. Um, we have, that's, it's called a 1D element. There are three types of line elements supported by NASTRAN and CAD. 
bars, beams, and pipes. And you can also have um, an actual preload on these, on these elements. Now, to define the geometry or cross-section uh, for a beam element is going to require several, several properties, several cross-sectional properties. Now, to input this, this data, you can either put that in from empirical data, or what's recommended is that you use the inbuilt uh, element library, which has a lot of preset standard sizes that you can just pick, and it's it's going to populate every property that's that you need for you. 2D elements are typically surface elements with uh, triangle or quadrilateral shapes as their basic shapes anyway. These surface elements um, can have either regular shapes or irregular shapes in the model itself. And they're, they're often used for 2D elasticity problems since they account for plane stresses and plane strains. <clears throat> now the, the main, the fundamental property of a shell element is the actual thickness. Uh, you can assign this thickness property to geometric surfaces or geometric solids, depending on uh, what your model requires. Now, 3D elements or solid elements are usually used to mesh volumes. Most 3D solid elements um, only account for translational displacements, and this is something to keep in mind. So the choice of element is very important. When using solid elements, the geometry is entirely described uh, by the geometry of the CAD model. Now, NASA and NCAD has tetrahedral elements, uses tetrahedral elements, and there are two types of those, linear and parabolic. Linear tetrahedron, tetrahedrons are mathematically stiff. So it's best to use these uh, only for trend studies where the uh, absolute results are not nearly as important as the relative changes in the results. Parabolic elements are much more suitable and much better general purpose elements that, that can be used for most, most applications. Now, NASA and NCAD um, terms the mesh itself as an idealization. So essentially, this comes from the fact that we're idealizing uh, the geometry to look like these preset standard elements. Now, for those of you that may have used the software, we actually have, we can set up different kinds of elements, different materials, uh, doing completely different things, performing differently in the same model. And you just have to create a different idealization for, for each type. Right? So for a complex model, for example, it can have solid elements. It could have an area that, that requires shell elements, and it could have components that require beam elements. So you can use all of these in conjunction, and the idea is to be able to convert um, the, the 3D CAD model into the best possible finite element mesh. Let's jump into the actual program real quick. And so this is a simple railing, a really simple, simple analysis. Now this was created using inventive frame generators. So this comes in, this, these beam idealizations are automatically created for us. But if we did want to create a new one, you could go into idealizations, select your type of elements. So for this, we're going to use line elements. So you can select bar, beam, pipe, uh, let's say bar for this one, select a material. And if your material doesn't show up here, you can always add it to the list. Oops, there we go. You can always add it to the list uh, by selecting a material here. So for this one, if we consider, let's say beam one, and we see that this, um, this, this structure is represented by a bar element. And the reason we're using a bar element instead of beam element is that 
we're not subjecting this to actual bending. So beam elements are allowed to bend, bar, bar elements typically are not. Now for this particularly, since this was used, um, this was created using frame generator, the properties come in from Inventor. So all your cross-sectional properties are already in here. But if you didn't have that, if you didn't have those properties to begin with, then you can select cross-section and you have um, different kinds of dimensions, different shapes that you can use, different channels. So you will have to put in, put in these properties. So I do have an analysis set up already. I want to make those visible. Now, our mesh settings here, we're going to use um, an absolute mesh size of one. We're going to use parabolic elements because, as we discussed, these are good general purpose elements. Now, I can also go into the settings mess with the tolerances on here. So let's just say I use a tolerance of 0 0.01. I can hit generate mesh. And we'll see those different colors. So if I just hit my actual model, this is our mesh of bars and beam elements. And the colors here represent uh, the colors or they correlate with the colors in your idealizations. So the mesh is quite fine. Loads are applied on the nodes, constraints as well. So that's all we um, we need. We can also add one more load if we like. That's going to be gravitational force. So Fy of minus 386.4. Right, so this here shows you that gravity is acting as well. So we're good to run now. Uh, NASA and NCAT also is really, really quick at solving problems. Now these, notice how uh, your results are in terms of bar stresses, not necessarily in, in terms of one Mises stresses, solid one Mises stresses, but this, actually behaves now as a series of bars and beams. Now the next model that I have is this little uh, channel here. So I'm going to jump into Nastra and get in. If you're new to the, the program itself, then the way you would get in from Inventor is uh, it's an environment within Inventor. So just go into the environments tab and open Nastra and get. So I'm going to use a linear static model for this as well. And notice we don't have an idealization here. So sometimes that can happen. So we want to create one. Right now, this is a really thin element. It's a really thin component rather. So we want to make sure we use shell elements. And this is when you would use them. When you have a thin walled component um, that needs a thickness but you don't necessarily want to be modeling that as a, as a solid. So I can select associated geometry and select um, different components if, of the geometry in case I want different elements. But if I don't select this, then these settings are going to be applied to everything, to the, the complete geometry. So I want to use a thickness of uh, 0.125 inches. And this is just going to be a standard thickness. Okay. Oops. Hang on. Notice I didn't select the material here. So I'm just going to pick something simple. Alloy steel. Right. So there we go. So our material populates here and we can 
we can now select that from the drop down menu. Now we're going in um, to actually set this up. So it's going to be fairly simple. I'm going to be selecting edges. It's those two holes there. I also want to I want to apply constraints on this end as well. I want to constrain the motion of, of these edges and make sure that um, the only way it's constrained is that it cannot translate in the y direction. I'm also going to apply loads to the same three edges, same side of it. Um, it's going to be enforced motion, actually. So I'm just going to displace this upwards by um, 0 0.01 inches. So now I'm going to, we can go ahead and create a, a standard mesh, a default mesh. Because, and the way we, you verify whether your mesh is okay or not is you look at these areas of high um, stress concentration, right? But this doesn't look like a particularly good mesh because the elements that we have here doesn't exactly represent, don't exactly represent a circle. So instead we can go into our mesh settings. I'm gonna change my element size to something uh, smaller. Like 0 0.10 inches and update that mesh. Okay, that's slightly better now. We have all of our information in. So we should be good to run. And just keep note too that, I know it seems pretty self-explanatory, but the more elements you have, the smaller you make those elements, the longer it's gonna take to calculate this. So you could get like infinitesimally small, um, but your computer might not be a huge fan of that. Um, the cool thing is, is we're actually running NCAD right now on some laptops. We're not even running on like super powerful desktops. Um, so just note that even our not super stellar laptops can run simulation like this. So you don't necessarily need a supercomputer anymore to be able to run advanced uh, analysis. Yeah. So um, that was a pretty, even though we had a fairly fine element mesh, uh, that didn't take very long to run. So that sounds actually really powerful in that sense. Uh, it can also solve a bunch of different element types, uh, problem types. So just as with the 1D elements, where our results were all in terms of um, bar, bar stress and bar 1 MC stress and bar displacements, here we're looking at the shell itself. So Depending on um, the type of elements you use, your, the assumptions you make are going to be different because this is clearly um, an approximation of the actual physical problem that you're required to solve. So depending on, on what kind of problem you're solving, what elements you use, the assumptions you make will have to be different and those assumptions will have to be factored in to your final results as well. Now, one other thing that I did want to show you here is, uh, let me just make these invisible. And one other thing that I wanted to show you was um, the actual mesh convergence factor. Now, we know this is a good mesh because if you look at the mesh convergence error, the highest, the maximum error here is about 0.4%. So that's okay for, for, an, for a solution error. So this is how, this is your preliminary way to verify and validate your results uh, from a simulation is, is you look at the mesh and you see if there's anything you can do to actually improve upon the accuracy of those solutions.
The last model that I have for you guys is a solid model. This is really simple. It's just a it's a regular beam uh, with a hole through one end of it, the loading end of it. So again, this is already in NAS and CAD. And this is how the problem comes into NAS and CAD from your CAD software, especially for solids. Typically, an idealization gets created automatically. Cool. We'll just fire up Inventor real quick. Um, while he's doing that, I'll answer a couple of questions. Um, wow, Nikhil blew up his Inventor. Good job, Nikhil. But uh, <laughs> since there are a couple of questions here, can we import assemblies for analysis? Yes. You can import anything from an Inventor for analysis. Um, just curious as to what you need to bring in, if it's the whole assembly per se. Um, and then the second one is, does Nashran NCAD make use of multi-core capability? Nikhil, can you answer that in about five seconds while you're hitting the open on this file? Multi-core capability, yes and no. <laughs> That's the five second answer. There you go, <laughs> okay. Um, that, that, that's going to require a much deeper discussion. Definitely. So Ian, uh, if you definitely want to talk a little bit about that, um, being able to use multi-core capabilities on your CPUs, um, definitely reach out to us and we can take care of that. So Nikhil's got this guy open. Almost. Awesome. And so Nikhil mentioned earlier that if you open your inventor and then you hit that environments tab, um, and then you hit Nashra and NCAD from there. If you don't have Nashra and NCAD in that list, it could be one of two things. Um, it could be you haven't installed it, in which case you need to install it, or um, it's not the add-in is not loaded. Um, and essentially, you just go into your add-ins. There's a big list of checkboxes, and then you just make sure you hit the checkbox for Nashra and NCAD um, so that gets loaded. Okay. So thanks for answering those, those questions, Nigel. Yep. So this is how it comes in. Um, I'm able to click it now, so thank goodness for that. But this is how it comes in. Um, a solid idealization gets created automatically. And if you don't have a material already set up in Inventor, then it comes in as generic. So you, you'll have to go in and change that material. But if you, yeah, if you do have an Inventor, say you assigned 6061 aluminum to that in Inventor, um, in your modeling environment, it'll bring it over, which yeah. is like kind of awesome. Yeah. So for this, I'm just going to choose a material. I will pick 6061 aluminum because Nigel seems to like that. So, and the color here is just to represent um, your actual mesh. So this is a really simple problem, just a very simple bending problem. So I want to pick, fix this end, apply a load on this end, let's say minus 5,000. And minus just represents that it's in the negative y direction. And I'm going to create generate a mesh. So look at my settings. I think I can reduce the element size a little bit, turn that to 1.5, generate that mesh again. All right. Now, no matter what I do though, if you look, actually, let's make this more visible. All right, so if you notice, this still doesn't accurately represent the geometry, the actual geometry. The meshes, there seem to be nodes inside this hole, which is not what we want. So when you have areas of stress concentration like this one, you want to, one of the settings that you want to turn on is go to me in, into your mesh settings, hit the settings button and project mid side nodes. Just check that box, hit okay and generate the mesh again. And that suddenly looks a lot better now. So I didn't change anything else. But when you have these um, these areas, you know, holes, fillets, uh, you want to make sure sharp corners. You want to make sure that you turn on project mid side notes. Just a quick quick tip there. So the rest of it looks good. 
should be good to run. And so this, the profile looks exactly like what you would expect. And again, when you look at your final results, all of your results are with respect to an actual volume. So these are all solid stresses and solid strains and solid displacements. Definitely. Yeah, I know we went over elements today, but something equally as important, if not more important than elements, are the meshes. Um, they're kind of intertwined and related. You know, elements comprise your mesh. So they're kind of intertwined in that sense. I feel like doing a mesh AVA might be super important because just being able to refine the mesh in a proper way without getting too crazy um, in terms of like element number um, be very valuable. So if anyone thinks that that is super valuable as much as I do, definitely make note of that in things like the survey and the questions and uh, we can make sure to prioritize something like that. I know that when I first uh, started doing simulation, I think, what is that, almost like six or seven years ago, uh, I was just like, Meh, I've got a really awesome computer. Let me just make the mesh size infinitesimally small and run this thing for like 16 hours. And then you get, a, you get an answer that's maybe like 0.5% better than the one that took you 30 minutes. Uh, it's not worth it. So um, definitely something to keep note of. Um, where to stop refining your mesh? Yep. At what point you kind of hit that barrier of, you've hit that convergence, yeah. <laughs> so definitely keep that in mind. Go ahead, Nikhil. Yep. And now some of these, um, these settings in here, right? The mesh settings, uh, they will require much, much deeper discussion. So. What are mid-side nodes, for example? What's the difference between linear and parabolic element orders? That's probably beyond the scope of this particular ABA, but please reach out to us and we can have that, that discussion. Uh, definitely, the mesh table. The mesh table. I'm a fan, I'm a big fan of the yeah, mesh this table. Is, this is awesome, especially if you have assemblies. The mesh table is, is awesome because you can you can edit your your meshes and your different kinds of elements and everything inside this this one table and keep updating yep per per each different solid so if you have multi different multi-body um like assemblies uh yeah. makes it a lot easier yeah so definitely so we'll jump straight back in here so just to summarize real quick elements in mesh affect the accuracy of, of your FEA solution. Um, they one of the things that you actually have a lot of control over. So you need to make sure you're choosing right elements, meshing. All right, good. Hello, everybody. We're back. I'm going to cut it right there. Um, scope out that summary screen over there. I do want to kind of get into, I just kind of want to get into our closing transition over here and talk about some of the questions we received throughout this presentation as well. Because um, as you guys know, if you guys have done any kind of simulation so far, meshing is a huge conversation and a huge part of the process. I was talking to a customer recently and they had like a whole dedicated team to just doing the mesh. <laughs> but it was a part of their simulation workflow. But um, a lot of good questions here in the queue so far. Um, let's see if we could uh, address any of these uh, for the benefit of everybody over here. Right, so a few things that came up, you know, does Nastran have brick elements, right? We talked about all the different types of brick elements at the beginning of that presentation, right? There's a lot of different applications and implications associated with that. Yes, Nastran does have brick elements. Um, and sorry, Pedro, are you on the, are you on here as well? Do you want to talk about brick elements at all? you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, brick elements, Nastran always had uh, brick elements. I think it does just how it is exposed to the user in Inventor. Uh, typically, uh, brick elements requires a lot of uh, editing on the geometry. Um, as you can imagine, a brick element has uh, you know uh, six uh, uh, sides, and uh, you, typically your solid would have to have uh, uh, six sides or something that you can sweep from one surface to the, and then you know 
the, the opposite side that should have the same uh, geometry. So you have to divide your solid in such a way that it can be hex measurable. So in that sense, it requires a lot more work than uh, than uh, tet elements. Um, tet elements, uh, you know, there are the linear tet elements and there are the uh, the higher order tet elements. Uh, the tet four elements uh, typically is not a good element because. Uh, uh, the just a formulation on the tet four uh, is uh, you know means that the the the, the strains within the tet four element is uh, is constant. So in areas of uh, high stress gradient, uh, it's just not a very you know accurate element for load the transfer for load path a tet a tet elements is just as good. Okay, it, it is a very very accurate, uh, but uh, that's why uh, I think. Um, uh, inventor natural when you uh, automatically uh, mesh a cat geometry it will create a higher order element uh, which is a tet 10 and you would have to turn that off if you wanted to use a linear tet element so um, yeah so just uh, you know uh, a brief discussion on solid elements uh, hex elements are, are good uh, quality elements but it requires more uh, user intervention uh, a geometry preparation before you can generate the hex mesh. Uh, TET elements, TET 10, high order TET 10s are good elements as well. Mm -hmm. And that's what the inventor will do if you use uh, uh, auto mesh there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, as, I mean, I was aware of like, you know, like linear elements and then like solid elements, but I mean, I feel like the conversation is a lot deeper than that for sure. So a lot mm -hmm. of different options, which I, I think would be a good topic for a future conversation for sure. And I realize a lot of these concepts transfer from both Nashtran and ANSYS, right? And I figure a lot of FEA solvers, is that correct in general? Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, you know, most of the... Uh, uh, these FA solvers today, they have a very rich element uh, libraries. That's interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and, and then <laughs> depending on the application or type of analysis, maybe some elements uh, is uh, recommended over other elements. Yeah, um, I got you. I got yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's super interesting that it's kind of relevant across different solvers and stuff. And so that kind of element library is a, something that we'll definitely have to talk more about in the future. Um, specific to Inventor, someone did say that someone did ask about the section view or like the internal stresses in particular. Um, there is a way to look inside of the uh, inside of the models for the Inventor Nashtran stuff. I believe it's under the it's tied closely with the section view functionality in Inventor already. So I know you could either like take a face or take a plane and just kind of do slices through the model to see what's inside. I don't have that exact data set or the exact workflow ready for you, unfortunately, but I do know section views are a thing in Nashtran and Inventor itself, in fact. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for more info on that or feel free to reach out if you wanna start a case with us and we can look at that specifically. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, uh, Pedro. That last example with the C channel, can you get the reactions at the holes specifically, uh, basically the bolt load in the Y and Z direction? Yes, yes, that's uh, one of the output requests. Um, it could go by and, uh, Okay. Right. So, so just uh, <clears throat> in the in the event or menu tree, I think. It, it is one of the options for you. To, Correct. To look at yeah. The on the course. results, there was a, a pull down, I believe, for the different directions as well that you right, can look right. at. So a lot of the reporting is pretty configurable in that regard as well. Um, I think you said this about automatic meshing, won't use hex elements. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Let's see, looking for B model. Uh, I think this is an interesting question that's come up as well, also from Trevor over here. Uh, looking at the beam model and the results, how do you validate the model? Do you compare it with hand calcs or you know, anything else? And uh, in general, I think this is kind of an interesting question for people that already have access to Nashtran and simulation, right? When you do a simulation, Pedro, how do you go from the actual results in Nashtran file to like, you know, validating it, saying it's like, it's correct, it's right, it's worthy of being passed on to the next bit of analysis. What does that process <laughs> look like, would you say? That's, uh, you know, that's uh, what, what the $800 question or $8,000 question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a bit of a wall to overcome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, we as analysts, we have to do all our D, do uh, due diligence to make mm -hmm. sure 
uh, that results are, are correct. Uh, so typically what you do is that if you have any uh, closed form solution uh, that you yeah. can do some uh, simple hand calculation, we st you start with that just to make sure that the, 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 the results from, uh, from a finite element model makes sense, right? Uh, you can do convergence uh, studies, you know, I think the, the video showed some uh, uh, convergence errors there. So that would be one uh, good way of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, checking the model. Uh, another way that you always want to make sure that the load path in your structure is correct. So there are many things that you can check to, to make sure that, that the results that you're getting make sense. Uh, and, you know, do testing. Uh, I think uh, uh, in a finite element analysis, it is uh, garbage in, garbage out. Um, uh, eventually, and, uh, you know, all, all these, uh, most companies, what they will do is that uh, in the end, they need to do a testing to validate everything. Uh, so what you do with a, 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 a simulation is that uh, you gain confidence in your model uh, and then you play with uh, a lot of uh, what if uh, scenarios. Uh, you come up with a you know optimized design, uh, and you know I would say that uh, one day we'll be able to to replace a physical testing <laughs> with an uh, analytical model. Um, hope, yeah. <laughs> but you know I think uh, everybody wants to see a uh, uh, physical testing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If not just for the analyst, then for everyone else with the team, right? Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I always, I always kind of imagine analysis as, you know, part of a larger workflow anyways, right? So it's not necessarily the end all be all of your process, um, but it does let you make informed decisions. It lets you iterate and innovate for a lot cheaper and a lot quicker than you would otherwise. Right. Yeah. So it's something good to keep in mind for sure. Um, and before I head off to the end over here, I do want to make a point, right? Uh, this is obviously a rerun of a previous session and, um, you know, I think, you know, maybe we'd all prefer something live in general. However, it's not always possible. And so I do have a playlist, um, actually a list of playlists available for um, viewing as well. You guys should be able to see my screen here. I'm going to post this link in chat as well. Um, and this is our YouTube channel where we host all of these recordings and more. And so if you guys weren't aware, ANSYS and the ANSYS side of the company does their own series of webinars as well weekly for the past 26 sessions over there, as you could see. Um, but we have a variety of videos from AVA ourselves. So if you want to learn more about Nashtran, there's a whole dedicated Nashtran playlist over here as well with the Autodesk side. And then some other specific stuff and smaller tidbits like these uh, tutorial ones over here. I could recommend any of these playlists and any of these videos if you want to learn any more about simulation on either side of the fence. Okay, so check that out for sure. Um, and uh, we did have one more question over there. Do you have any hand calcs for the C-beam example so you know it's correct? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'll, I mean, Pedro might have some explicit documentation on C-beam analysis and stuff, but um, the closed form yeah. solutions for C-beams, I think are largely solved, right? I, I would I'd be surprised if they weren't. Um, well, you know, I think uh, for the C-beam, uh, you can go to Rourke, and then from Rourke, you can uh, calculate, you know, maximum stresses, but, uh, you know, probably not for that specific boundary condition that uh, was shown in the, in the, in the example. What is, so, uh, what is Rourke exactly, Pedro? What is that? I'm not familiar. Uh, Rourke, I think it's uh, called the uh, formulas for stress and strain or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's just a textbook uh, oh, I used I uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, yeah. in school. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, yeah, I, I did like a, a coffee cup example a while ago, and I, I asked one of our other simulation engineers for some help. And he pulled out like a bunch of textbooks. He's like, check it out. There's a bunch of thermal equations over here that you could check out. That's just there to validate, right? And so a lot of that right. still does connect back to that kind of closed form solution, like you were saying. Yeah, Rourke is a good book for sure, is the C-Beam uh, tutorial that I could look at on Oh, yeah, I'm not sure about that, unfortunately, Trevor. Um, I, as far as I know, yeah, I, I don't know what the original data set is from. I, unfortunately, we don't have access to that, uh, that engineer or that um, data set anymore, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so um, there, there are obviously some formulas available in textbooks, like you're saying. Um, and I, I think it's a really interesting part of simulation in general. So definitely stay tuned for more of that. But I don't think I have any more info for you there, Trevor. 
Um, we're coming up on the end of the hour over here. I do want to make this kind of a timely one. Um, we did have the summary slide, um, not really any new information over here, but as you guys have seen, simulation addresses a wide variety of real world problems. And so I know we talked to a lot of manufacturers and designers ourselves, but you could imagine the possibilities for a variety of other applications as well. Um, cost effective iteration and innovation available. Uh, Nashtran, like you said, we have some documentation on that, like you just saw. A lot of the concepts transfer over into Ansys and other solvers as well. Check out that playlist in the chat menu. And of course, if you're interested in expanding or extending your team's capabilities, please reach out to us. Uh, Gemma Chawa in particular will be able to help guide you and uh, steer our French uh, relationship with Kativ forward if you guys have any more help, okay? Okay, so let's see. Any other comments or questions or concerns? You got anything else for me, Pedro? Again, appreciate you being on here today, man. Um, any closing comments here? No, um, nice uh, talking to, to all of you guys. Um, and uh, you know, if you need any 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 help, uh, KTV is here to help you. Perfect. Yeah. And then again, there is a survey coming out after this presentation, so feel free to comment and let us know if you have any concerns about our structure or suggestions for formatting changes or future topics. We're happy to hear them, and we're, we're happy to keep sharing more knowledge with you guys. All right. So thanks again, Pedro. Thanks everyone for being on over here, and we'll talk to you guys again next week. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.